Hey fam, it's me. I'm back. I have new hair. I have a bougie tall boy seltzer water. The squeaky chair is here. The bad light quality. The gang is back together. <laughs> what a week, huh? I kept thinking that I was gonna record earlier. I'm recording this on Friday. It's for a lecture on Monday. This probably isn't gonna be as good of a quality as the last video. I was going to try to bring you no makeup realness, but um, without makeup, TMI, but without makeup, I look like Nate Silver right now. Today, I'm bringing you another blatant ripoff of a ContraPoints masterpiece, How to Spot a Fascist. But please, please watch that after you've watched this because this is just a low budget, all around worst version of Natalie's work. I'll link that video in the description. I've swapped in different content, obviously, uh, because today we're talking about how to spot a pseudoscience, not a fascist. Once again, I'll have divided my video using timestamps. I think there's gonna be seven points. Uh, don't hold me to that. Hopefully it'll be fun, less philosophical than last time, more clickbaity, probably a little shorter, and hopefully more applied because spotting pseudoscience feels relevant and important. With that, let's get into it. Okay, we're off with a bang. The idea seemed crazy. Crazy is maybe kind of an inflammatory word. I'm gonna to return to this point later. Uh, but what I mean is that the ideas smack of conspiracy, they're contradictory, they have exaggerated claims. I think one thing that's going to come up throughout this video lecture is what's the difference between pseudoscience and just misinformation or conspiracy theories. And I could give you a Merriam-Webster definition right up at the top, but I think I'm going to leave that to the end to sort of wrap together all the ideas I go through. So for now, let's start with the ideas seem crazy. Uh, to the extent that maybe it takes really hearing the ideas a couple of times to even believe that people could believe these kinds of things, like there was no moon landing, that the earth is flat. Uh, I'll, that's, those are some of the craziest ones. <laughs> but some of these, like I say, it takes a few times just to hear the content to even conceive of the fact that people could really believe this. And that's tied into the concept of the illusory truth effect. The illusory truth effect is a psychological phenomenon where upon repeated hearing, ideas seem more likely to be true. Airplane. It's fine, I'll wait. If you have multiple professors who give you the same information, multiple credible news sources report the same phenomenon happening, that's not the kind of thing I'm talking about. I'm talking about hearsay, where if your friend were to tell you uh, a claim, maybe that they don't have any evidence for, or the evidence is not very compelling, or it sounds kind of crazy, and then another friend tells you, and then you hear it on TV, and then another person says it, over time, uh, due to familiarity, those ideas can kind of take on the ring of truth. So I think a lot of times that's behind some of these crazier sounding claims, why people could actually believe them. Uh, but also another point is that not everything that sounds crazy actually is crazy. Uh, I'm just sort of guiding you towards a first kind of gut instinct thing for you to keep your eye out for. Lots of things can sound crazy from the outside, but that's really just an invitation to sort of dig deeper. And pseudoscience crazy claims are crazy because they sound like a conspiracy, meaning that they require alternate explanations, usually involving secret groups with illegal or harmful plans, contradiction, um, great coincidental happenstance, um, or exaggerated claims. And this is different from just mind-blowing science, uh, like those Arctic foxes, I'll put those back on the screen while I'm talking about this, uh, that Rick was talking about, who with great accuracy can find and pounce on their prey, uh, in this in the snowy North Dakotas or wherever they are uh, You know more accurately when they're pointing north. I mean that sounds pretty insane also 
But um, that kind of mind-blowing science is based on solid methods. And we'll talk about methodology a little bit later. Um, And just (laughs) to note, uh, we'll probably also get to this later in the semester, or I'm sure you will talk about this in your career as scientist here at IU. Um, But there is a bit of a replication crisis going on in the sciences, and especially the social sciences like psychology. Um, So lots of very... Uh, slick or even crazy scientific findings have turned out not to replicate. So if you hear a scientific claim that's sort of too good to be true or too crazy to be true, it often is, unfortunately. But to take a quick step back, I want us to remember our priorities about science and ignorance, and especially to return to what Dr. Barwich talked about, um, how science should good science should open us to bigger questions and to better questions. And pseudoscience often does the opposite. It really shuts the door on issues by providing full explanation, all the answers um, with one crazy package together. So your second indication is that the ideas aren't falsifiable, by which I mean The pseudoscientific ideas that you're considering have literally been set up in such a way that they cannot be falsified. So let's take an example. How about climate change denial? There are people who believe that climate change isn't happening or that if it is, it's just a little bit and it's not driven by humans or man-made industry. And you could imagine that a piece of information that might falsify or at least critique that perspective is that there is an overwhelming consensus, nearly 100% of climate change scientific experts that climate change is real and is driven by man-made industry and byproducts, etc. But so another facet of their belief besides climate change isn't happening is that scientists are trying to convince us that it is even though it isn't. And so a consensus of scientists for them wouldn't actually be a piece of falsifiable evidence, but rather, uh, of course, scientists would all agree together because they're the ones who are trying to convince us that this is happening. And so a potentially piece of falsifiable information is then taken as further proof. This is closely related to confirmation bias, which I'm sure you've heard of before, which is the idea that um, humans pay a lot more attention to uh, bits of evidence or pieces of information that confirm a theory we might have uh, rather than we overweight the confirmatory pieces of evidence relative to the disconfirmatory. So another example is astrology. I know that astrology for a lot of people is like a fun personality quiz or a hobby. So I'm not trying to attack or come for your hobbies, but um, I I am trying to attack the idea that uh, because Mercury is in retrograde, you're going to have a fight with your boyfriend this week. Uh, What I'm trying to attack, I guess, is just the causality of those claims there. Um, Things like astrology or personality quizzes, or even um, I was looking up um, pseudoscience claims. And one really great one I found is the lunar effect, which is the belief that there's a correlation between specific stages of the moon or the lunar cycle and um, behavior and physiological changes, especially like women menstruating, or I think lots of people think that more babies are born when the moon is full. And there's actually been no evidence to support these claims, but they can be really attractive because there's this kind of neat pattern of explanations, especially when you only pay attention to the days of the full moon and how many babies are being born that day. That's confirmation bias. Your third clue that what you're looking at is in fact pseudoscience is that there's bad science involved. And in fact, I think the involvement of bad science is what differentiates pseudoscience from just your plain old conspiracy theories or deliberate or otherwise misinformation. I think this is sort of the kernel 
It's not just bad information, it's bad information about bad science. And when I say bad science, I suppose that sounds clickbaity again, but I do really mean that. I mean it sort of philosophically, uh, counter to the kind of good science that we've been talking about so far in this course, like what uh, Dr. Ann Barwich came and talked to our class about, or like what Dr. Stuart Firestein talks about with expanding ignorance and coming to ask better questions. I've already touched on that a little bit in this video. So the kind of bad science at the heart of a pseudoscience claim is one that has no systematic practice of hypothesis development or predictions that can be confirmed or disconfirmed by evidence collected. There's no interest in expanding uh, the circle of ignorance or for asking better and new or more refined questions. Um, none of that is really going on in pseudoscience claims. And so on that front, I mean bad science, but I also just sort of mean faulty, sloppy science. That's kind of what gives the juice to any particular pseudoscience claim. So we need, we need an example. Story time, YouTuber story time. So maybe you've heard of a little phenomenon sweeping the United States called the anti-vax movement. And I don't know how informed any of you are about the pillars of anti-vax ideology. Maybe that's strong, I don't know. But uh, the kind of central worry, I think, of a lot of anti-vaxing parents, because it's usually parents who don't want to vaccinate their children, is a concern that vaccines cause autism. And, you know, sort of like ableist medical practice things aside, you can really ask the question, do vaccines cause autism? Is there a causal connection there? Even if it's, you know, very small probability, where did parents get these ideas? You know, now we hear about like, maybe you've read about doctors who even recommend not vaccinating their your children or whatever and um sort of it seems like it started recently where did all of these ideas come from it turns out that they came from a paper published in 1998 in uh it was published in a journal called the lancet which is a peer-reviewed um medical journal of good repute as far as i know i'm not a, a medical journal expert and this study was published by a scientist named Andrew Wakefield and the study claimed that the measles, mumps, rubella, the MMR vaccine caused autism in 12 children. So, you know, a small number, but still concerning if true. And this is really where all of the kind of hype around, this is the first time anybody ever drew a connection between vaccines and autism. And maybe this particularly drummed up a lot of fear because the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine is so common. I can guarantee that you've all had it. I've had that vaccine. Um, and so it seems like something that if true parents could really be worried about, you can imagine this got a lot of people worked up at the time. So since that article was published, it has been retracted by the journal in which it was published, The Lancet retracted it, and in fact, Andrew Wakefield, the scientist and author behind this article, has been exposed as a complete fraud. His data was fabricated, and there, there wasn't this causal link between vaccines and autism, and there is no evidence for that claim whatsoever. So, you know, you'd think, Wow, a lot of stuff got drummed up about this. Turns out it was nothing. In fact, quite embarrassing for this man whose career is, I hope, over at least as a publisher of pseudoscientific medical <laughs> journal information. It didn't matter at all that it was retracted, the article. It was sort of too late. And the anti-vax movement um, still has this deep concern about the connection between autism and vaccines at its center. So so you can see what I mean that there's some bad sloppy science at the center of a pseudoscientific movement, 
even if that science is later disproven, the fact that there like was something kind of very sciencey, people latched onto that. It felt very true and it's hard to shake. Your fourth clue that what you're looking at is pseudoscience is that the people who are spouting these ideas are selling you something. And selling you something, again, clickbaity, I don't just mean merch, although who knows, I'm sure, you know, good pseudoscience could get some merch behind it. Anyway, I don't just mean merch, I mean like a worldview. I mean, they're trying to get you on board with a way of looking at the world and maybe some science to justify their way of looking at the world. So again, let's have some more story time. When I'm thinking about people who want to sell you something, we've we've talked about phrenology a little bit before and um, expand lot there's been lots of um, really problematic kind of eugenics-y race and gender science around the shape and size of your physical skull, your head, um, and using that to justify white supremacy, the inferiority of women. In fact, I was reminded of this really, really excellent article, uh, I think in the Smithsonian Magazine. Yes, I will link it in the description. This article is called The Statistician Who Debunked Sexist Myths About Skull Size and Intelligence. And um, this article is all about a, a scientist, uh, a woman named Alice Lee. She was one of the first women to attend London University. And when she was in graduate school, there was this predominant notion that men's brains were larger, so their skulls were larger to fit their giant brains, and that that meant that men were therefore intellectually superior to women. And, you know, if you just sort of take how inflammatory and maybe ridiculous that is and set that aside, you could imagine... Uh, you could imagine a version of this that's not totally crazy, right? Like, it could be that bigger brains are correlated or causally related to bigger skulls, and maybe bigger brains and bigger skulls are reliable indicators of intelligence. Like, if that's how that worked, uh, it's, it's not. But if you imagine that there were just men and women and men's skulls were consistently bigger than women's skulls, and you're saying I'm really having to do a lot of work to kind of keep this up. There is a version of this that could be true in some possible world, I guess. But uh, what this scientist Alice Lee ended up doing is she just went in and like measured all of the men's skulls in her department and then measured, I think, her own skull and some other women that she had access to. And it turned out that it just didn't hold up at all. There was a huge variety in the skull sizes of the male faculty at the London University. And in fact, many of them had much smaller skulls than her own skull, and there wasn't any sort of regularity between purported intellectual superiority and skull size. <laughs> and unfortunately, Alice Lee, uh, though she as this article title, subtitle says, laid bare the false claim of women's intellectual inferiority, she failed to apply the same logic to race. So, <sighs> sigh. But anyway, there's been lots of this sort of race and gender pseudoscience that likes to have some kind of scientific intellectual backing to a worldview um, so that you can have maybe scientific reasons for subjugating women or people of color or you name it. And lately a lot of, <laughs> turn out to be kind of pseudoscientific, maybe there's some shots fired here, but there tend to be a lot of these kinds of problematic scientific claims in evolutionary psychology. Um, it's pretty easy to spin an evolutionary yarn about why people may or may not engage in certain kinds of behaviors or have certain kinds of preferences and all kinds of problematic researchers have claimed convenient things like having affairs are natural. I, I'm going to fact check myself on this, um, so I'll put up text if this is wrong. 
But I believe the Yale researcher, John Barge, had some kind of study that claimed that having like a picture of your wife on your desk made you more likely to have an affair with your secretary because whatever the argument was, you know. Um, So that's the kind of selling you something I'm talking about. Don't buy it. The final clue I'm going to talk about in this video for whether what you're looking at or not is pseudoscience is that people can't stop believing it, which is maybe the most clickbaity of all my point titles. But what I really mean here, and I think this applies, I don't just think, I know this applies far beyond pseudoscience into all kinds of beliefs, is that the structure of beliefs and the way people take in evidence and update what they're thinking and how they consider new information has everything to do with their social context. So some kind of indications around conspiracy theories or pseudoscience type things is that there's a community or even a cult surrounding the ideas rather than something like an academic discipline. An academic discipline uh, <laughs> can sometimes look kind of like a cult, but what I mean here is that there, there aren't experts. I suppose you don't even really have to be an expert. There aren't people um, doing their own research and sharing the, the fruits of their search. They aren't comparing evidence. They aren't sort of arguing about details and updating their hypotheses and then going off and trying to gather new data, even if it's to support their own pet theory. These people are in a community of people who believe the same thing and they learn to trust their in-group. If you, if your credible sources are only people who believe the same thing as you, it can become this kind of feedback loop that's very, very difficult to break out of. And I'm sure as you're aware, this is extremely relevant at this time in history. Where you get your information from is just as important as the actual information you get. Trust in social networks is really important, and this gets into some of my own research about beliefs, but this is because of the differential costs of of your beliefs. Let's imagine that you're, you know, somebody living in a rural conservative part of the United States, and you're surrounded by people who... Um, don't believe in climate change and you know our big MAGA hat wearing people. (laughs) So you can imagine that, you know, as, as just whoever living in this community, it doesn't matter so much if I get my beliefs just right about, uh, the climate. I'm not, I'm probably not going to be a person who's in charge of like making climate decisions. Um, I'm not in charge of whether or not we like stay or leave the Paris, uh, climate agreement. You know, I'm not deregulating or regulating uh, CO2 emissions for large corporations. None of that's up to me. So I'm not in a position where like my the cost of my beliefs being wrong is like not a huge deal because if my beliefs are wrong, I didn't have that much impact anyway. But if my beliefs don't align with my social circle, if my beliefs are different from my neighbors, if they're different from my family and my friends, I might get ostracized. If I disagree with them, they might stop being my friends. They might stop talking to me. They might shun me. They might make fun of me, you know, whatever the variety of negative options are. So to me, as just somebody living in this community, doesn't matter so much the cost to getting my actual, like the truth value of my belief strong, doesn't matter so much. The, the, the cost of like misaligning my beliefs with my community is really high. It totally outweighs the cost of getting the beliefs right. So the, the truth, the, <laughs> the cost of the truth versus the cost of the social dynamic is way out of whack. And so when you already trust your community, and you want to stay sort of enmeshed and aligned with them, you can imagine people's motivations um, sometimes leaning away from actually doing, frankly, the hard work, depending on your sources um, and the access you have to information, of figuring out the truth. So what are we going to do about it? Well, hopefully to make this a little bit more 
<laughs> applied and maybe a little bit more hopeful, the spread of pseudoscience, misinformation, fake news, it's not inevitable. We can do things to fix it. And in fact, to do another very topical uh, comparison, major TV networks have finally figured out how to cover Trump's very pernicious misinformation. I don't know how closely all of you are following this election, but you probably know that President Donald J. has a few times now offered statements suggesting that he believes that he won the election and that, you know, there's fraud in the vote counting process and that the vote should be stopped in some places and kept going in other places, yada, yada, yada. Um, basically trying to cast doubt and fraudulent claims on the sort of structure of our democracy, which is very dangerous. And also just like, there's no evidence for any of these claims and there's no evidence that he has won. Um, and so actually it's very interesting that the major TV networks cut out, they didn't give him the platform. They stopped, uh, share, they stopped streaming his press conference. Um, and whenever they presented his misinformation, they first stated that it was misinformation. All of these things are great. So I'm going to, it was a very disorganized example, but I'm going to leave you with three tips. Actually, all these tips come from a really great journal article by this um, science, social scientist, Lewandowski. I will link it in the description. This was a lot of stuff that I was reading when I was doing my qualifying exams um, about the spread of information and how police get updated. Here are three tips for combating pseudoscience. One, pre-exposure warnings. Before you ever share a piece of pseudoscience, piece of misinformation, something that you know is not true or you have great doubts about being true, say first, before you say the information, say that it is wrong. Say that it is misinformation. So actually, this is a thing that the, the media did really well with claims about having won the election. They, you know, the little like banner at the bottom of the... I don't watch TV. I don't know what it's called. It would say, without any evidence, victory. So before you can even get to the claim, your eyes have to go across that warning. That's tip number one. Tip number two is repeated retractions. It basically just repetition. Make sure to say as often, if not much more often than the claim itself. In fact, that's a little bit of a nuance point. Try not to repeat the fraudulent claim or the piece of misinformation or the pseudoscience. Repeat that not very much, but repeat the retraction. So uh, again, with the example of fraudulent claims, you want to say there was no evidence. The claims he made had no evidence. Without any evidence, he said this, you know, without any, without any proof, without any examples, blah, 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 made fraudulent claims about the democratic process being in question. Tip number three is to fill the gap. By filling the gap, I mean providing an alternate narrative. It's very difficult in the way that people update their beliefs to just take an explanation away, to say, nope, that's wrong, that's not how it works, and then not to provide an alternative explanation. Um, this might be at the, co at the root of why the anti-vax movement continues despite the retraction of that paper. We still don't totally know what causes autism. But what I mean here is if you ever are going to tell somebody that a claim is false, a claim is pseudoscientific, there's no evidence for that, you want to replace it with the thing that is true, the explanation uh, that is in play, the piece of relevant information for the competing belief that you hold, et cetera, et cetera. So just to recap, those three tips are a pre-exposure warning, repeated retractions, and filling the gap. So with that, um, I hope you have made it through. We are getting really close to Thanksgiving break. Um, thanks for watching just minutes and minutes of me talking to the camera. I hope this has been kind of fun. And yeah, I'll, I'll catch you all later.
story time. Oh my gosh, that's so violent. <laughs>